So, gentlemen, welcome to this uh, final panel of the day. And I'm keen that we minimise everything but the meat of what's coming. So let me do a very quick set of intros. Uh, to my left, General Sinek Carter, Chief of Defence Staff. I hope you all realise that by now. Infantry Commander, uh, Moderniser. His peers include Stan McChrystal, uh, David Petraeus, Mark Milley, say no more. Um, at the far end, you'll find the new Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defence, uh, David Williams, who returns to the MOD for a bit of a holiday, I think, having done his real work for six years with the NHS. Uh, and if you think fighting for a defence budget was difficult, I think the NHS uh, is equally as uh, difficult, perhaps more so at times, including uh, the start of COVID, having only joined the MOD about, what, six weeks ago now, David? I mean, rejoined six weeks. Six yeah. weeks. Uh, so this is uh, a beautiful uh, honeymoon period for him at the moment, I'm guessing. Uh, but he returns to the MOD, having had a long history with the department, uh, uh, with carrier strike, uh, with the uh, deterrent, uh, with the Iraq inquiry, um, working for uh, ministers. So he knows the department well. So we're going to get five minutes from CDS and uh, five minutes from David. General Patrick is on stage because it's his conference and he's allowed to, and he wants to shout at me later. So we're looking forward to that. But um, apart from that, uh, we'll have this 10 minutes and then question and answer, usual stuff. For those online, send it through uh, the C+. For those here, stick your hands up and I'll try and get to as many as we can as possible. And we'll ask our speakers to keep their uh, uh, remarks and answer the questions quite short. But with that, General, over to you. No, thanks, Peter. And good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you. Um, I hope, as you will have learned today, we've come a long way since the platform that Richard Barron's built with the Joint Forces Command, and as we've now stood up Strategic Command a, a year and a half ago. The idea was to move on from jointry. Um, integration, I would suggest, is needed at every level, not just at the operational level where the term joint applies. And I think modern manoeuvre in any of the operational domains will be enabled by effects from all domains in the future. And indeed, it was in the past. I saw this vividly as a divisional commander in Kandahar, where the integration of land, air, cyber and information operations realised an outcome that was far greater than the sum of the parts. So I would suggest that we need to operate, so we need to integrate at every level of command, from the strategic, through the operational, to the tactical, as well as horizontally across the operational domains of maritime land, air, space and cyber. Hence, we've charged strategic command with being the frontline command responsible for this integration. It's also the case that we've placed inside strategic command the capabilities that we need to operate effectively in that gray zone below the threshold of war, including intelligence, information warfare, special operations and cyber. And this, if you like, gives us a one stop shop for the force generation of these really important capabilities. And of course, this gray zone challenges challenges is up in other ways, as I think has been part of the discussion today, because in seeking to protect our free and open way of life, there is that great risk that we will completely undermine it if we overprotect it. Now, there is also much else that the command does, including the strategic base, our overseas supply chain, and our equivalent of the string of pearls that is our network of overseas operating bases that enables so much of our forward deployed presence. Importantly, it also provides the conceptual component of our fighting power. Last September, we launched what we called our integrated operating concept. It contains a number of ideas, but there are two that I would wish to stress. The first is it sets out a new approach to the utility of armed force in an era of global competition and a rapidly evolving character of warfare. It updates our approach to deterrence, noting that we have added a fifth C, that of competition, to the original four Cs of comprehension, capability, credibility, and communication that make up our deterrence doctrine. Now, our rivals in this global competition are invariably assertive and, author and authoritarian. They don't distinguish between peace and war. They see the global playing field as a continuous struggle involving all of the instruments of statecraft, ranging from what we call nuclear war to, of course, peace. And they want to win without inciting a warfighting response from us. Deterrence therefore requires us to prevent their achieving their objectives with fait accompli strategies, as we've seen in the Crimea and the South China Heat Sea, for example. Now, strategic commands, grey zone capabilities are at the heart of this effort. As I touched on earlier, 
the second big idea is about integration with allies nationally as an enterprise across government and within the operational domains in the armed forces. This latter part is what we call multi-domain integration. This is Defence's most important transformation initiative, and it is the core business of strategic command. It will require a major change in culture. It's tempting to think of it as being purely about technology, but of course it's also about process, or doctrine as we would say, and people. In terms of technology, we know that warfare is increasingly about a competition between hiding and finding. It will be enabled at every level by a digital backbone into which all sensors, effectors, and deciders will be connected. This backbone, or combat cloud, will enable all of the operational domains to be linked together from the strategic level to the ship's captain or the company commander. It will deliver a secure cloud of accessible data, think smartphone, for robotics, automation, synthetics, and artificial intelligence with decision-making being achieved at the speed of relevance. Software will be as important as hardware in determining what our armed forces will be capable of in the future, even if we're not going to be taking our computers to a knife fight, Patrick. But we also know that predicting the right combinations of information-centric technologies will be very challenging. Hence, we need an emphasis on experimentation. And this will be a very important element of what Strategic Command does. It is salutary to be reminded, as Rand did some 15 years ago, that hardly any of the great military inventions of the last century emerged directly from a military requirement. They came from the outside world. And we are unlikely to develop the capabilities we need unless we do so in partnership with the outside world, where most of the innovation and technology is to be found. Realising these sorts of relationships will involve, I would suggest, the adoption of a new outcome focused approach to procurement that shares risk and opportunity with our suppliers, enabling collaborative development and incentivizing innovation to build the agility and adaptability we need. It will also, I hope, make it possible for us to seize disruptive technological opportunities with a responsive commercial function at the leading edge. We simply can't afford the luxury of a process that uses excessive specification as an insurance policy against program risk, and we must reduce cost. Now, this type of relationship must be based on a more open and transparent two-way conversation with industry, recognizing that we all need to step up to the plate when it comes to the defense of our country. And a key element of the integrated review is the defense and security industrial strategy, which will look across the defense and security sectors to identify how we can enhance our strategic approach to ensure we have competitive, innovative, and world-class defense and security industries that drive investment and prosperity to underpin our national security. We need to think of this as a genuine national enterprise. I'm sure, though, that the most important element of multi-domain integration will be about our people. Our career structure has to evolve from being fundamentally designed for generalists to something that is better able to recruit and retain the specialists we increasingly need. This means clarifying the skills we require through a common skills framework that will enable the sharing of skills, particularly STEM skills, on an enterprise basis with industry. This will allow lateral entry, markedly improving our approach to diversity and inclusivity, and making us more aligned with the world of work. It will also require us to have different policies for remuneration and reward. No longer will rank be sufficient for those in the cyber, data or digital professions. And their skills will be so precious that we will need to manage them centrally in a properly unified way. The recently announced Reserve Forces 2030 review places this front and center in its recommendations. It establishes three categories of reservists. The reinforcement reserve, whose principal role is to provide the skills that we need to access on a routine basis such as the specialists I've been describing. The second is the operational reserve that will comprise reservists at high readiness for contingent tasks, including national resilience, operations, and warfighting. And the third category, the strategic reserve, contains those principally ex-regulars who have a statutory liability to be available for further depth to our contingent capability. 
look in the general Richard Barons's. Defence is in a good place post the integrated review. For the first time that I can remember, we have the ends, as in the integrated review, the ways, as in our integrated operating concept, and the means, as in the multi-year spending review settlement, in balance. We are, for once, not looking at a tsunami of optimistic assumptions and efficiency rolling towards us in the next spending review period. This is fortunate because we are confronted with two very profound challenges. The first of these is how we establish a strategic culture, posture, and way of warfare that is fit for purpose in this new era of global competition. And the second is how we modernize at the pace of relevance to be able to handle future threats. And this is where strategic command has a fundamental role to play. Thank you. Uh, General, thank you very much indeed. Uh, there is lots to get people's teeth into. I'm delighted that we can perhaps talk a little about reserves. There's a whole industry relationship. There's culture, there's people, there's STEM and STEAM and all the rest of it. But um, David, over to you. Uh, thank you. And look, really pleased to uh, be able to join you today and to have been able to hear uh, at least some of the panel uh, panel discussions. Uh, I thought I'd just make a few uh, points to build on uh, some of the remarks from uh, uh, from CDS. Um, six weeks uh, back into uh, the department, uh, I still can't quite decide whether I'm more surprised by the things that have changed uh, while I've been out or by the things that are still the same. Um, but one thing that's definitely changed uh, and, uh, you know, built for the better uh, is the, the formation of strategic command uh, and that really clear focus on uh, integration, integration for a purpose uh, across the domains, orchestrating, uh, enabling, uh, and I'm absolutely confident that that's uh, uh, an integral part of our uh, approach for the, uh, uh, for the years ahead. Um, you don't need me to tell you what a fascinating time this is to be uh, coming back into uh, defence, but let me just uh, uh, echo one of uh, General Nick's uh, points, which is that, uh, I mean, in the 30 years since I first joined the department, um, I honestly can't think of a time where the... Uh, ambition and clarity of purpose as set out in the integrated review uh, and the defense command paper uh, has been so well matched to the resources at our disposal uh, through the spending review settlement. Uh, that's not to say that there isn't lots to do uh, and money is always tight uh, in, uh, uh, in defense, but we uh, start, I think, with a, uh, a really good foundation and we have a really uh, strong uh, opportunity uh, ahead of us in the uh, in the immediate future but but with that opportunity I, I think also comes responsibility we've absolutely got to make the most uh, of that alignment uh, and we can't let that opportunity slip uh, so for me I think that means a pretty uh, you know relentless focus on delivery uh, on how we can uh, remove blockers on how we are agile and responsive uh, in our approach and in our uh, decision making. Uh, we've really got to get up and out of the traps uh, uh, quickly now to make the most of the, uh, uh, the opportunities uh, ahead of us. Um, I think you've touched on acquisition uh, and approvals uh, uh, earlier today. So let me just join uh, that up with a sense of agility and responsiveness, if that's not uh, uh, too difficult a link for people, uh, people listening in. Um, if I had a word cloud for the issues that have been raised with me since I joined six weeks ago, uh, approvals would be there in 64 point font, bold, double underlined. Uh, and I'm absolutely determined that we need to make rapid progress uh, here. Um, I'm, I'm slightly wary, uh, particularly today when the news cycle is, uh, uh, is dominated by uh, the Prime Minister's previous uh, senior advisor, uh, to draw uh, immediately positive lessons from my experience of the past year in the Department of Health on, uh, uh, on COVID-19. Uh, but when you have a disease uh, that is doubling uh, in a matter of days, uh, or you have PPE stocks that are measured in uh, hours, not weeks or months, the pace of decision making becomes really quite important. Uh, and actually, we know that in defence, we are good at agile, quick, 
decision making, including in acquisition, uh, in support of operations through urgent operational uh, requirements uh, and the like. In a world of constant competition, that just needs to be more our norm uh, than the way in which traditionally we have operated. Uh, so for me, that means delaying our approvals, um, uh, being clear about the decisions that are needed and who is making them. Absolutely, we need really professional scrutiny applied ideally once. Uh, we need to match our procurement uh, approaches as well as our approvals to the uh, natural underlying cycle of development of the technology or capability that we are, are buying. We need to be really serious about early fielding of capability and then developing uh, that through uh, life. Uh, and in a world where forward posture is important, uh, uh, forward engagement is important, we need to be really, really clear up front about support, availability uh, and sustainability alongside our, our acquisition. Let me let me just say uh, uh, a quick word about uh, about people uh, as uh, as well. Um, you'll you'll know in Stratcom that I, I think we're uh, at our best, and I've seen this over my career in defence when uh, military colleagues and uh, civil servants are, uh, if not integrated, but absolutely uh, aligned and bringing to bear. Uh, their different perspectives and experiences and skills uh, in, a, in a shared endeavour. Uh, actually, if I think back about some of the things over the past year that have gone really well in our uh, collective response to uh, COVID-19, uh, alignment joint working of central government, the armed forces, the NHS, local government, academia uh, and industry partners uh, that has been really, really important to uh, some of the things that we've been able to achieve uh, over the past year. Now, it won't surprise you that as Permanent Secretary, though, I, I have a particular interest uh, in the role uh, of civil servants in defence uh, and how we uh, also need to step up uh, over the next few years, not only with that focus on delivery uh, that I've already talked about, but also in thinking about some of the... <coughs> Uh, mindset challenges, some of the challenges to the way in which we uh, think. If you think through the integrated review, for me, that kind of emphasis on alliance building, on influence, on deterrence in all of its guises, on how you calibrate escalation and de-escalation, how we ensure that our strategy throws through to decisions, uh, not just on deployments, but on capability, uh, on longer term policy, how we're making sure that we join up with government, uh, with partners and uh, allies. All of that are, for me, inherently political, often with a small p, but inherently political judgments. Uh, and there's a really important role for civil, uh, civil servants there. It's as much about a capable and confident Department of State uh, uh, as uh, about a capable, uh, confident and agile uh, military headquarters. Uh, and when we get that right, when we do that together, uh, we are absolutely at our best. So for me, look, there's lots to do around governance and process. Uh, there's lots about people, quite a lot about mindset as well. And we need to get all three right if we're really to make a success of the opportunities uh, ahead of us through the integrated review. Thank you. Mm -hmm.